Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and good morning to our colleagues in the Americas. Uh, welcome to this webinar on cities and COVID-19, uh, food access for vulnerable communities, which is jointly organized by uh, FAO, RUAF, ICLE, RICOTO, and uh, UN Environment. Um, my name is Charlotte Fléchet. Uh, I work for RICOTO, and I will be your host today for the next uh, 75 minutes. Um, so the webinar is actually uh, a part of a series of webinar uh, on the food systems approach in practice, which is promoted by the One Planet Network on Sustainable Food Systems. Um, and the Sustainable Food Systems program, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with it, is actually a multi-stakeholder platform that aims to support countries to shift to more sustainable food systems uh, using a systems-based um, approach. But uh, before we move on uh, with the introduction of the topic and of the speakers, I would like um, to invite you um, to uh, read those tips uh, on how we can all have a smooth webinar together. Um, so now all attendees are in a, a listen-only mode, uh, which means that you cannot uh, unmute your speakers. And, and therefore, uh, we invite you to uh, send questions to the presenters directly by posting them uh, in the question box, which is uh, located in the control panel uh, on your screen. Um, and when you write a question, please indicate to which presenter the question uh, is addressed. And when we finish all the presentation, we will then uh, select a few questions from the question box for the, the Q&A. Um, if necessary, if we have uh, a large number of questions, we will select uh, up to five additional questions per speaker, uh, which we will um, uh, collect uh, and, and, and uh, respond in writing and send to all the attendees uh, with a, with a follow-up email. So this means that uh, uh, the webinar is actually going to be recorded uh, and the link to the videos and the presentations will be shared via email to, to everybody, even the ones who were not able to actually join us uh, in person today. So actually today we are extremely lucky to have four wonderful speakers that come from a, a wide uh, range of, 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 of backgrounds and that have very diverse uh, expertise. Um, first, we have Jamie Morrison, who is the strategic program leader for uh, FAO's food systems program. Um, he will actually provide a short uh, review of how COVID-19 yep. is uh, affecting um, uh, urban food systems across the world. After his introduction, we will welcome Kate McKenzie, who is the director uh, of the, the Mayor's Office of Food Policy uh, in New York, who will um, share about New York City's efforts to ensure access to healthy food for all its citizens. After this, uh, her presentation will be followed by an introduction by Dr. Esau Galukande uh, on how the city of Kampala in Uganda is adapting the functioning of its city markets um, to keep everyone safe and, and well fed. And then finally, the last presentation will take us to Quito, uh, where David Hakome Pollitt uh, will explain how the city's resilience uh, strategy helps the authorities in the city to respect to respond to the impacts of COVID-19 uh, on the food system of Quito. So now that we are all comfortably uh, seated uh, and ready, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, uh, Mr. Jamie Morrison. So Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to all of you and thanks very much for taking the time to attend this webinar in what is an extremely busy and difficult time for, for all of us. Um, so cities with their high population densities are particularly vulnerable to the COVID-19 pandemic. And many cities we're finding do not have adequate capacity to address the disruptions to food systems that are being caused by the response to the current health emergency. And one of the things that this has done is to highlight the vulnerability of food systems, along with the associated risks that we all know about, but which are especially high for the 1.2 billion people living in congested and overcrowded informal urban settlements. Urgent action, urgent action is required to ensure that 
food and food systems function while actions are taken to prevent the spread of the virus so that this pandemic does not result in a food security and nutrition crisis in urban areas over the coming months. And in relation to these actions, I'd just like to highlight two fundamental points. First, it is high time that we acknowledge the key role that cities and local governments play in ensuring access to food of a large number of the global um, population. Secondly, it's time to rethink and build back better, making food systems more inclusive, more sustainable and more resilient to shocks like the one that we're facing at the moment. Now, so to better understand um, the role that the cities and local governments are and can play in facing the COVID crisis, at FAO we've administered a short questionnaire um, over the last six weeks or so, um, and we've received responses from about 180, 100, 150 um, cities around the world, covering a broad range of city sizes, and within them, responses from both local governments and also other urban food system stakeholders who are able to provide information as to how um, cities are responding. Uh, this information is helping us to map municipal responses to the emergencies, to try to identify gaps in those responses, and also to collate and synthesize lessons and recommendations which are being learned in some cities, which are perhaps at an earlier stage and which can be transferable um, to other cities. The sample is, is by no means statistically representative, but I think the large number of responses that we've seen in such a short time clearly demonstrates that cities and local governments are playing a crucial role in taking actions to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 on food systems, and also in confirming our assumption that they can and should be playing a major role in influencing the longer term transformation of food systems for better food security and nutrition. Uh, as you can see from the slide, the, the results of the questionnaire can be sliced in a number of different ways, whether by region, by income group, by size of city. And, and what I'll, I'll do in the next couple of slides is just to present some of the salient um, points that we're beginning to see emerge from the survey, noting that the survey only closed um, last weekend, so this is a snapshot and the, and the analysis is very much ongoing. Um, next slide, please. What, what, so what measures have um, mostly affected the urban food systems during the pandemic? What we're finding in terms of the, the responses we've received is that the closure of schools and the subsequent suspension of school meals is one of the main issues which has been reported in all regions worldwide. Um, uh, uh, so in the second category of, of um, issues is restrictions around selling food in public places. So for example, we found in 70% of the respondents there have been the closure of restaurants, canteens, street food outlets. In 60 odd percent of um, respondents had said that there's a restriction on mobile street vending, whether that be formal or informal. Um, similar percentages for restrictions of opening and access to stores and markets and also i think importantly the um, restrictions to the use of public transport and this is particularly important for um, those more vulnerable groups who may have to um, travel and don't have their own means of travel um, to acquire their food um, and yeah the, the, the restrictions on public transport have made this particularly difficult and we're starting to see now, and particularly in terms of the responses from the questionnaire, some of the impacts that are coming through. So both in terms of um, limited supply of, of some food commodities, but also in some cities, um, not, not all at this stage, but in some cities, particularly those in low and middle income countries, uh, increasing prices and some yeah, significant increasing double digit increases in prices of key commodities. Next slide, please. And turning to some of the, the key actions that we're seeing um, being made in urban areas to try to at least maintain or improve the functioning of food systems while restrictions are in place. Uh, a few of these include the establishment of food hubs, the promotion of e-commerce, um, using public spaces as delivery points or collection points, 
uh, strengthening coordination um, between local governments and with the private sector and non-governmental organizations and also monitoring availability, food availability and prices in urban markets, which is, is particularly important. And just to give some examples um, from the, what that we've seen from the survey, um, in the Lima metropolitan area, for example, a mobile wholesale market service has been established to distribute food to eight districts of the metropolitan area. And at the same time, the municipality is working to monitor um, market prices. In Muntun Luma in the Philippines, uh, vegetable seeds are being distributed to families in urban and peri-urban areas to promote backyard vegetable gardening. In Heliconia in Colombia, um, an ordinance has been issued which requires the monitoring of food supply and distribution. And you know, it, it has to be said that in some of these situations, pre-COVID or, or pre the, the, the crisis, these sort of systems simply weren't in place. And, and so I think you know, we're seeing if we can maintain some of these actions, I think it will be very beneficial moving forward. It's also important to underline that in the vast majority of the cases, the measures that have been taken by municipalities have um, been undertaken without access to additional funds. So this is already digging into to already overstretched funds at the municipal level. Um, and the final slide, please. So just thinking a little bit also about the, the, the work that we're doing beyond the COVID crisis, because obviously this is an immediate concern, but we also need to, to think about some of the potential opportunities that this provides us um, for building back better. Um, so at, at FAO, we're particularly concerned about the sustainability of urban food systems and how we can support actions by national and urban authorities to move towards a more sustainable path. In our urban, urban food agenda program, we've been raising the profile of cities and local government actions. Um, we, as I've said before, we see their role as essential um, both during the shocks, but also beyond that. And I think we'll see this increasingly recognized as we move the process um, towards the Food System Summit in the latter part of, year, of, of um, next year forward. We're also currently actively supporting cities and local governments in more than 20 countries um, as to how to mainstream food systems into their policy planning and actions in order to create a, a more enabling environment to move towards more sustainable urban and peri-urban food systems. Um, again, very much thinking about support to improve food security and nutrition. Um, we're also promoting a, an integrated approach to policies and programs for food systems and green spaces. The idea here being to improve the urban and peri-urban livelihoods, but also to increase the resilience of, of cities and people, particularly in the face of um, you know, what some might see as an even larger emergency, the, the, the sort of climate emergency. And finally, our, our urban um, Food Agenda website, which has recently been launched, has a new section dedicated to COVID-19 um, and it's now online also on the FAO Urban Food Action platform. This platform provides a very good opportunity to collect practical experience from cities around the world, um, how they're coping, what sort of responses they're putting in place, so that we can share these and, and yeah, move towards a, a, a better understanding of what works and, and what perhaps isn't working so well. And it's also here that you can find more detailed information resulting from the survey, which will be coming online over the coming weeks. So this slide just provides um, some of the hy hyperlinks. I understand that the presentation will be shared with all of you, so you'll, you'll be able to click and explore a little bit further. Um, but I'd just like to include by reiterating FAO's commitment to supporting cities and local governments in building better, building that better, and to make our food systems more resilient, inclusive, and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie, for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction and, uh, and also your very powerful message uh, on the need to build back uh, better food systems that uh, are actually more resilient in the face of shocks such as COVID, but, but also uh, climate change. 
Um, may, I, may I just quickly ask you when when the results of the survey uh, may be may be made public to the to the audience? But you you are muted. Sorry, too many things to control. But we're hoping for for a technical brief um, to be issued, which will report on the results of the survey. Um, towards the end of May. So, so, I mean, it's a pretty short deadline, but I think it's a very important to get this sort of information out, even at an early stage. So that, that's the deadline that we're working to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sounds great. Very interesting results so far, uh, and I'm sure even more uh, to come in, in, the, in the full reports. Um, so thank you very much, Jamie. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, Kate McKenzie is the director of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy in New York uh, and since taking up this role in last October, she has made access to healthy food one of her priorities. Um, during her presentation, Kate will talk about Feeding New York, which is the, the brand new plan that the city uh, has adopted to keep uh, New York City fed during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so Kate, the, the floor is yours. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I, I, there we go. I can see the slides. Um, so and I'm going to begin. Uh, there we go. I wasn't able to hear you, so um, I'm going. I'm going. Thank you for that. Um, um, it's a pleasure to join you all um, uh, and provide you an insight into some of the the food work that is occurring um, in New York. I appreciate hearing. Um, Jamie, from you and from the context that you were able to set um, uh, in relation to ensuring that cities uh, are supported and um, not just in this crisis, but certainly looking out towards the longer term. Um, let me begin by saying that um, as of last evening, New York City has roughly 186,300 confirmed cases of COVID um, in, in, within the five boroughs of New York City. Um, it goes without saying that we have been um, dramatically uh, affected by, by the disease um, and certainly by the effects of food insecurity um, of that COVID vulnerable population and those beyond, which I'm going to speak to um, shortly. Um, in the, I would say the middle of March, um, a very robust multi-sectoral food team was, um, was compiled by the mayor, um, Bill de Blasio of New York City. Um, and we were charged um, to, to ensure that all New Yorkers um, were provided with the food they needed uh, and, and therefore were, were losing access to as a result of the guidance of social distancing and the effect of, of the disease itself. Um, there are two central work streams uh, uh, depicted here, one that I oversee, which is feeding New Yorkers, and another which is around ensuring that the supply chain um, is, is attended to. Um, this is a very simplistic slide uh, for operations that are anything far from simplistic. So I'm going to talk through um, these, different, uh, these different strategies and, um, and tell you a little bit about the operations that we've stood up in a very short amount of time. The goal of, uh, of feeding New Yorkers, quite simply, is to in in enable food security, um, both in the immediate term, by ensuring that no New Yorker has to worry about where their food is coming from, and the strategies that we've deployed to, in to achieve that um, and the, the most robust form is an emergency home delivered meal program. That is um, any New Yorker can call um, our emergency number 311 um, or log on to nyc.gov slash get food um, or through we've trained more than 500 um, NGOs who particularly serve um, senior citizens um, and authorize them to become enrollers of this program. By enrolling in the program, 
individuals will receive delivered to their um, to their housing uh, developments or door fronts a box of nine meals to last three days, and then every three days a similar box. That is um, that is last intended. Uh, you can enroll for four weeks at a time, um, and then an additional four weeks can be added on top of that. Um, those meals um, ensure that they are intended to be emergency meals, but they also provide for protein, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, and certainly uh, attend to the various cultural and ethnic needs of, of the city. Um, in particular, there are kosher meals available, there are halal meals available, and um, increasingly so different, um, particularly South Asian um, and Caribbean uh, influenced meals are, are being provided. Um, again, those meals are, are in, incredible. I will, I will say that as a whole, and I will speak to this more in just a bit, we've delivered more than 22 million meals um, uh, through this and, and some of the other uh, strategies that I'll speak to. Um, those meals are delivered to nine hubs across the city and then uh, delivered using our taxi and, uh, and limousine services. Um, if you've been to New York, you know that taxis are a vital way of, of, of transportation. Um, and as uh, people are no longer, um, I think it's 75% of the New York City workforce is not working um, uh, in their physical offices right now. Um, those taxis no longer um, are, are needed in the way that they, they tend to be and um, ensuring that those drivers also have, um, have a stable income um, is, is of incredible importance. Another, you know, Jamie mentioned that the school meal programs um, are vital, um, certainly in pre-COVID times. In New York, they serve more than a million meals a day. Um, since the schools have shut down, more than uh, about 520 different schools across the city have opened up to provide for um, grab and go meals um, to both senior, uh, to both children, of course, as well as adults. About two thirds of the meals are being served to children um, and another third for adults. Um, we also, um, in addition to these two um, sort of city delivered uh, and sponsored programs, where in, uh, New York City is um, unique in that we have a very robust um, emergency food system of soup kitchens and food pantries. Um, many of those are run by um, very small uh, volunteer networks um, themselves who are older and so have had to close down, uh, again, due to social distancing um, and, and isolating measures. Um, but we've been supporting uh, certainly with food resources, but also financial resources and staffing resources, that network to enable those, um, those really necessary uh, uh, systems to be able to continue serving food um, again during this crisis. And then it's imp very important to underscore that we, have, um, we are working really closely with our state and federal um, governments around necessary policy supports um, that are needed in this time. A real uh, simple example of that is the way in which um, we are feeding children right now is um, a model that we use during the summer, which is the, called the Summer Food Service Program that is traditionally operated in a congregate setting. Um, and in fact, I just learned this morning that uh, that, that policy certainly was waived um, for this emergency provision during the school year. But as we move into the summer months, um, those uh, similar types of operations will be able to operate again in a non-congregate setting. Um, so people will be able to continue the grab and go form of, of meal provision. Also our SNAP program, our, our food stamp um, protection for, for uh, individuals in need of food resources, um, we're pushing that that be expanded and, and many other policy levers um, to ensure that we are um, able to provide for New Yorkers um, in this incredible time of need. Um, the second uh, work stream that I would just like to speak to very briefly is about ensuring um, a, a very robust uh, food supply chain. So the top level goals um, of that work, of course, are to ensure that the food and related goods distribution are not disrupted. 
that we're supporting our city's food industry workers, which really are essential workers, and enabling the long-term resiliency of the food sector, which of course is very much in line with the intentions of this call. Um, some of the um, specific strategies that I'll just allude to uh, briefly um, around freight logistics. Um, we, you know, certainly um, in the beginning months of this crisis, um, different states had different types of, um, of hours that they were allowing trucks to be on the road. Um, some of the rest stops were closing down. And so to ensure that long haul truckers and food movers were able to do those, um, those routes, the city stood up to uh, rest stops to ensure that there was a, a place for um, rest of those, of those drivers. Um, from a food production and distribution lens, we are ensuring that we are um, developing in some cases and certainly maintaining relationships with regional and food producers, um, whether that, those are farmers, whether those are regional co-packers or, or distributors, um, and certainly ensuring that the, um, whether it's the most recent situation around meat production um, across the country and just having a line of sight into possible glitches in the food supply chain so that we can um, uh, be preparing for that and um, developing a pipeline for, um, for those types of products. Um, in the one other area that I'll just mention, certainly from the consumer facing side, we're ensuring, um, again, New York is an interesting um, uh, landscape when it comes to grocers and that many are independent and have a lot of ethnic and, and different specialty items. And we want to ensure that those are provided for also, um, particularly, again, in some of the hardest hit areas, which are um, some of our Asian, um, Asian communities um, where some of the groceries have closed um, due to sickness and other areas. Um, I will also just mention that the workforce and labor piece is tremendously important. Um, never before, like now, are we realizing again just the, the vital um, imperative to address uh, workforce um, amongst the food industry. Um, we were never in a shortage of food, but we, we were very vulnerable when um, uh, people stopped uh, being able to go to work due to sickness or other um, other reasons. And so addressing the employment gaps uh, with a focus on grocery stores is very important. Um, and ensuring also that for those that can continue to go to work, that childcare provisions are set up. Um, because they are essential workers, we are, um, uh, and most childcare centers have closed, um, any, uh, any worker in both an emergency food, soup kitchen, food pantry, grocery store, or other areas along the supply chain, the city is providing childcare to those um, to those uh, individuals. Um, the next slide, please. Um, this is just a this is a graphic so that you can get a sense of where the meal provisions are happening. Um, you know, you can see the darker blue areas. There are the areas um, uh, of most penetration. Those are also the uh, direct relationship with uh, the disease itself and, and where the incidence of highest, um, highest concentration is there. Um, but you can also see that um, everywhere in the city um, is reached by, uh, by the food distribution operations that we have in place and we'll continue to hone in um, and get even more specific to ensure that we're uh, distributing the food as equitably as possible, um, particularly in areas that are not represented in this map and some of the like really uh, the minutia, the real sort of neighborhood level um, is an area of intense interest and, and focus. Um, the next slide um, also just shows this is um, all of the different sites, whether they are schools, whether they are emergency feeding pantries, um, where uh, different uh, individuals can go to obtain food. The school sites are open Monday through Friday from 7.30 in the morning until 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, and the various pantries um, have variable hours, but all of those we're making available, again, through um, partnerships with our NGO organizations, as well as um, social media and web. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this actually is uh, was as of Wednesday when I sent Charlotte this deck. Um, we're up to now to 22 million meals, um, again, through the various distribution modalities. And on the right, you can just sort of see the separation there. Um, the largest being the blue are the school sites and the greenish color are those distributed by our um, emergency management department. Uh, next slide, please. And this is where we, it's really, really striking. Um, and these are our estimated food insecurity figures, which also have um, dramatically increased um, since, the, since earlier in this week. Pre-COVID, the city had an estimated um, prevalence of food insecurity of 1.2 million. Um, it, with new unemployment figures out, I can say that that total food insecurity currently as of the 15th of May is, um, is potentially 2.6 million New Yorkers um, are food insecure as a result of COVID, which is just staggering. Uh, next slide, please. You can also see here, this is just some of the metrics that we're tracking um, uh, from, uh, and these are updated weekly. So when you see a decrease, know that it is, um, uh, this had to do with most people applying for cash assistance um, beginning at the, be at the beginning of the month, um, but that maintained uh, a, a really high number. So we're tracking the number of people who are applying for food stamps or, or SNAP, um, the number of people who are applying for cash assistance, um, the year-over-year -year changes in jobless claims, and what's particularly interesting here in the last um, in the last column are searches um, through a city system called Access NYC of people looking for uh, for food, frankly, and that has increased by almost 10,000 percent compared to last year. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to speak to a few of these, and I also just want to highlight that um, I, I want to appreciate the time that we're in, which is still very much a crisis. And while we're capturing certainly our insights as we move through through these days, um, these are these are moving and evolving um, in terms of our lessons. But what I will say is that having um, a very multi-sectoral, multi-agency team that brings very different perspectives and uh, is essential to the work that we're doing right now. Not every, in fact, many people are new to food overall, but bring logistics or transportation, um, sustainability focus, and certainly op operational acumen. Um, that has been essential to this work. Um, I will also say that, um, you know, to make sort of lemonade out of lemons, as they say, um, this emergency order has allowed us to innovate and, and be active in ways that we just couldn't in normal times. And so uh, trying out different operations um, and just doing rather than being stalled by, um, by perhaps over analysis in some ways has, has been very uh, refreshing. Um, I think another sort of key insight is having um, a line of sight into food distributions to, again, get at that um, real visual and commitment to equity. Um, you know, it's, it's tremendous, uh, certainly in a city this, with the size and scale of New York, um, to be able to solve for every individual. Uh, but we need to know where food is moving to ensure that we can stay true to our goal of um, having no uh, we won't let anyone go hungry. I also think it's really uh, interesting that farmers markets and our, our green market system were really the first to, to lean into developing practices around um, retail behavior changes, um, whether it was bagging produce and really limiting um, the, the foot traffic, um, allowing for electronic uh, financial transfers rather than cash, um, they were really, really innovative in that and, and proactive in that space. Um, you know, just again, from thinking about a resiliency um, lens going forward, we have significant infrastructure challenges. Um, and sure, if we, while we want to move more fresh food into the city, we have, um, we have a lack of, of uh, refrigeration um, to be able to hold that food even temporarily uh, for distribution. And then again, this is a sense to the uh, a nod to the density um, that we experience, and certainly people living 
and very uh, tall, um, uh, populous buildings, really moving food from the curb to doors is very challenging when seniors in particular are advised to stay at home um, and not leave. How we move food um, in socially distant ways um, from a truck to a door, the last 10 yards of delivery has proved to be particularly um, vexing. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I look forward to uh, continued dialogue with each of you and from learning how peers in other cities um, themselves are addressing uh, COVID-19. Thank you so much, Kate, for, for sharing these inspiring strategies and lessons and, and also for, you know, underlying the, the issue of, of equity and how important it is to uh, yeah, to 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 uh, find solutions that you know make it make it fair for everybody, and and also highlighting the role of supply chains and and food distribution, um, you know, when we talk about food access. And um, so, thank you so much for this this very nice presentation. I just a reminder, so we will send the the presentations after um, after the webinar, so you can you can all look back uh, at what has been said. Um, another comment as well that I, I, I received from the, um, the volunteers that are helping us collect the question uh, is that they would like you to indicate what speaker uh, you are addressing your question to. So, so please remind, uh, remember to do this when, when you write a question. Um, thank you very much. Um, our, ne our next speaker now is Dr. Uh, Esau Galukande. Uh, he is the Deputy Director of Production and Marketing at Kampala City, uh, Capital City Authority. Um, where he supervises the implementation of programs on urban farming, fisheries and aquaculture. He is also responsible for the administration of uh, several commercial services in the city, such as the management of city markets and support to SMEs. Um, his presentation will focus on the city's response to ensure continuous uh, access to food markets in a context of informality. So, Esau, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, and greetings to all of you from Uganda. Uh, my discussion is entitled uh, Ensuring Continuous Supply of Food from Markets to the Citizens of Kampala. Perhaps you can have the slides, please. Next one, please. So just to give a background to the listeners, Kampala has a resident population of um, uh, two, mil two million people, and during the daytime, uh, population can be to above uh, five million. Now, 70% of the city's population is employed in the informal sector, and markets form a significant part of this. Food in the city is supplied through three types of markets. We have what we call the permanent markets, which are in a fixed, uh, uh, um, the mobile markets. These are markets where So we are having some connection issues here. We'll wait a few more seconds to see if SL can come back. Am I back again now? Yes, you are back. Hello. Hello, we hear you. Okay. Okay. So I just wanted to say that we have a resident population of two million people during the daytime, um, during the, during the nighttime, and about five million during the daytime. So a lot of people come to Kampala from the surrounding uh, metropole, and that seventy percent of the people are employed in the informal sector and markets are a very important uh, source of employment. So we have three types of market in the city. We have what we call the permanent market, which is in a, a fixed position. We have seasonal markets, and then we also have the mobile markets. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Can you see it now? The next slide, no, I'm, I'm still seeing the previous one. Hello. Hi, Esau. Can you, can you see the slides on the directives to control the spread of COVID? I can see the slide, but I was wanted the next slide. I have the one that talks about the daytime population. I wanted the, the continuous slide. Okay, let me let me try again. Okay. You should be able to see it now. 
No, I'm seeing that. <laughs> Perhaps I could go. I don't know. Have you got the one with the table? I I have the slide with the directives to control the spread of COVID. Yes, I don't see that one here, but maybe I could continue because that's the one. That's the one. Yes, I can see it now. Okay. So um, in March uh, 20, our government issued a number of directives which are aimed to control the spread of the COVID-19. And so to go through uh, the ones that really affected markets, the five of them, one of them is the fact that public transport and use of, pub, of private vehicles uh, was uh, banned. And that means that ease of travel to the markets by the citizens was negatively affected. Now we have motorcycles that transport people as a form of transport, which we call border borders. These were instructed not to carry passengers, but they could carry goods. So what that means is that for the case of transporting food in the city, we could use these ones, but they will not transport people to the market. Then for the permanent markets, they were maintained. Clearly the instructions were, the instructions that were given, hello, am I still there? Hello? Yes, you are, we can still hear you. Sorry. Um, the, the permanent markets were allowed to operate, but they were given standard operating procedures like social distancing and um, hygiene uh, protocols to follow. So this means that the supply of food continued in the markets, but because of social distancing, uh, the number of vendors in the markets were reduced by a third. Then for the mobile and seasonal markets, these were suspended, and that means that the source for food in the city was reduced. Trucks and delivery vans were allowed to continue, which meant that deliveries to the city can continue and uh, from the countryside. So we can move on. So, so in light of all these uh, changes, the city put in place uh, a number of measures to ensure uh, that there's reduced congestion in markets, that there was constant supply of food to consumers in an orderly manner, and to ensure the livelihood of vendors and other vulnerable residents is not severely affected by the lockdown. Now, these methods were arrived at, at uh, following consultation meetings with the vendors and also with the e-commerce platform operators. So what measures were introduced? You can look at the next slide. Okay, so there, there are four categories of people. So members of the public that have regular vendors from who they shop, we encourage them to get their contact numbers and be able to call them from their homes and generate a shopping list. And then these vendors would be able to use a cyclist or a border border to transport the food to the buyer. Uh, we do have uh, mobile uh, platforms on our phones for money transfer. So that was electronic money payment for that system. Then there's another category of members of the public with no regular contact uh, in the market, but in need of assistance. So we looked at 29 markets in the city and we got phone contacts of the market leaders and train them through a process where they will receive phone calls and assign an order to one of the market vendors and then be able to pack it and deliver it to a consumer. Once again, this was through telephone and a cyclist would take the food to the consumer and payment was through mobile money. The third option was the use of e-commerce platform operators. We have quite a number of these in the city, for example, one called Jumia and Safe Border. And these were encouraged to include fresh food uh, option uh, on the traditional platforms and they were linked to uh, markets in the city provide this function then the the other category are residents uh, residing near markets and they could either walk to the markets or cycle there we did encourage these visits to the markets but also uh, set out messages that they follow the standard operating procedures to ensure that they were safe in public spaces next slide please Next. So has it worked? That is a big question. Well, um, physical markets, physical visits to the markets continue to take place. And, um, um, but um, the numbers did reduce and they all uh, followed the operating procedures. Now for the calling shoppers using the adver advertised contacts with the market leaders, uh, this was uh, picked up by many residents. And on a typical day, they, got, they get between 10 to 50 orders, depending on the market and locations. And the largest number of orders is during the weekend. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now for the operators of the um, uh, e-commerce platforms, 
um, they uh, actually achieved reasonable um, sales and they got uh, quite a number of uh, clients linked to them. In some of the markets, uh, the larger markets, they've been able to register within one month an average of 50,000 US dollars of sales, and in the smaller markets, 10,000 US dollars. And collectively, it's estimated that they're handling to uh, 20,000 clients in, in the process. Next slide, please. Now, what have been the challenges with this system? Well, the new uh, shopping system was introduced during the lockdown period, and there was so much happening in the country and apprehension. So acceptance was originally low, um, but then slowly it was understood by the vendors. Then some of the contact persons in markets uh, get overwhelmed. Uh, some would receive about 15 phone calls in a space of about two minutes, so they could not easily be able to synthesize all the orders and attend to them adequately. Then for some of the products, uh, different units of measure are, are used because we have uh, kilograms for, for example, for tomatoes, but then some of the orders will come with people prefer who prefer to buy in a hip. So having a standard measure on somebody describing was a bit difficult at a start. Next slide, please. Now we've also learned lessons that uh, online marketing has not only secured jobs uh, for the vendors in markets, but has created jobs along the distribution chain. For example, we know that there are about 400 cyclists engaged in the delivery of food each day. And we know that uh, they're also the food distributors uh, who uh, pack uh, the food that has been uh, uh, ordered, and at least the two, uh, the 200 of those that we know of at the moment. We believe that if the challenges are removed, the ones I mentioned earlier, this could be a major form of food uh, procurement within the city. Next slide, please. It was on before that. Okay, now um, I've put in my final slide pictures of what the markets look like after we've had the social distancing. And you can see that uh, there's a space of between four meters between each of the vendors. And one thing that is so clear is that the number of vendors in the markets has reduced. But now it is the few visitors that come to the market and also the online marketing, which has kept the link with the residents of Kampala. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for a very good presentation, Esau. Uh, I think it was particularly interesting to hear about how Kampala's response uh, really embraces the popular features of the city. You know, things that citizens use every day, such as the, the boda bodas or the, the regular telephones, uh, rather than using smartphones that, you know, might use use the internet. Um, and, and when I was uh, reading your presentation before, it, it reminded me actually of an article I read recently by uh, Margaret Wheatley, uh, it was on systems thinking, where she, she basically emphasized that um, in order to create a healthier system, we need to connect it to more of itself and that living systems contain their own solutions. And I thought the example from Kampala uh, was, was quite good to illustrate the, the point that she was making. Um, so thank you very much, um, Essa. And, and now let's move uh, to the final presentation of this webinar. Uh, please allow me to introduce to you uh, David Hakome Polit. He is the Metropolitan Director of Resilience and the Chief Resilience Officer of Quito. Under his leadership, the city developed a resilience strategy for uh, Quito's agri-food system, which proved to be very useful in these times of pandemic, as you will see in David's presentation. So David, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm very glad to be here sharing uh, Kito's experiences, challenges, and uh, uh, what we have learned uh, so far. Uh, can we move into uh, the first slide, please? Can you see it? There seems to be a delay sometime. Yes, I, I, I see it now. Thank you. So uh, first of all, just to understand how the, the city, the city's or, or the country's risk, uh, risk management system uh, um, works, when there is a when there is a, a, a catastrophe or, or a challenge, um, um, there are certain um, organizations that activate themselves, and that needs and, and that needs to be connected to uh, the planning uh, of the city. Uh, to face man-made or natural hazards. 
uh, such as the ones related to climate change, which are the ones that we have been uh, working on. The thing is uh, that right now the pandemic presents different challenges uh, because it doesn't observe any boundaries. So um, as it has happened before, the country's management system activates um, COIS, which are emergency operations committees, uh, in different scales. Now we have them all activated um, because of what I was mentioning uh, before. Uh, and uh, that means that there is some coordination occurring between national level and um, local level uh, at the same time. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, city of Quito, the city of Quito has right now the PAC, which is the Quito's Agri-Food uh, um, Covenant, uh, which holds a very large, large number of actors uh, within the, the agri-food system of the city. And with them, uh, and along with the Metropolitan COI, uh, we have been coordinating to support uh, food provision, uh, facilitating um, these, these, these activities. Next slide, please. And so, uh, as part of the as, as part of the resilience strategy of the food system, uh, we've been working into um, analyzing the food insecurity of the city. And um, right now, the, the the pandemic has been uh, proving that what we were analyzing was uh, which made the city vulnerable is correct. Right now, the pandemic is affecting um, access to food from an economic point of view because there is less income and higher prices of food. Uh, but also physically, uh, it, it has been quite difficult uh, in some places of the city to deliver food because of the inadequate urban development, and, and, and especially for the ones who cannot leave home um, when, there, uh, when that is allowed, or a deficient transportation system also plays a role. Uh, when it comes to food availability, uh, production has been, has been quite, quite stable, but distribution to retailers had, had to be rethought. And, um, We've, we've been working, as you will see uh, later, um, how to uh, reconnect um, these distribution channels uh, with production. But on the other hand, the, the food donation system, the food bank and, and the Patronato San Jose, they have been working uh, quite well. Uh, they've, their effort has been of great help um, to, to the city, especially for the most vulnerable ones uh, because of their um, management systems that are uh, uh, appropriate. On the other hand, we've been noticing that uh, sometimes food is not used adequately, uh, especially when people doesn't know how to cook. So and so, if you are not able to access to prepare food and um, you don't have skills of cooking, well, that presents a challenge. Um, and also, sometimes um, food can be unsafe. And uh, finally, um, uh, we have a deficiency of food provision during emergencies. And, and, and that is clear, we've been needing to arrange and adjust uh, different uh, uh, programs and, and projects and put in place some new ones in order to do that. And of course, uh, we have a lack of food storage that also plays against us. Please, next slide. So uh, uh, as a response, we've been working uh, through different scales, uh, as you can see in the chart, and through different links um, within the food chain of the city where neighborhood or organization has been key, for example, to uh, enable, the, enable us to respond in a better way. But also urban farming um, has been uh, very important to, to reduce the number of people um, that, for example, needs to leave home. That allows people to stay, to stay home and stay fed. Um, the, the urban farming program of the city uh, currently uh, produces 1.35 million kilograms of locally fresh and ecolog ecologically produced food, where 57% uh, uh, of that uh, amount is consumed by those producers, and 43% is sold through uh, supply chains uh, to other people. And um, a, we distribute 11 tons uh, weekly of food uh, for the most vulnerable that are produced uh, with, uh, by these farms. So. There's, uh, this support has been quite important. Uh, and if you look at uh, a, different, a different scale, the metropolitan scale, um, uh, the way that we've been coordinating um, with, uh, for example, um, retailers, but also lar larger um, food distributors and producers have been, uh, has been of quite help. Um, we've been able to attend um, around 373 neighborhoods and, and um, 
we are in, we are reaching out to around 40,000 uh, people. Um, and of course, uh, technology and apps have been um, uh, uh, of quite help to amplify uh, these efforts. Can we please uh, move to the next slide? So um, we have been, uh, in order to do this in, in an orderly fashion and, and in an efficient way, uh, what we did is we um, uh, identified vulnerable population and where there are where there are where they are located, either within parishes or administrative zones. And so far, we know that we need to attend uh, to um, 160,000, 61,000 people, and that allows us to distribute public funds. Uh, NGO support and private donations in a more efficient uh, way because we, because we know uh, where they where they are located. Um, uh, can we move into the next slide, please, or to the next slide? But we also been monitoring uh, the capacity of the city uh, to receive food, and as you can see, there are some uh, red numbers, um, and this depends on uh, culturally and socially um, appropriate diets. And that doesn't mean that the city has not been receiving these products, but that we need to take a look at them and make sure that they are available. Um, next slide, please. So um, uh, the way we've been working is by, com by um, connecting uh, the municipal capacity, their office, our offices, with uh, vulnerable population distribution, as you can see in, in the map. Next slide, please. Same thing uh, with uh, food distribution from a public and private offer um, with regards to um, uh, vulnerable population. So we know where we need to put a little bit more effort uh, to bring food uh, for them. Uh, next slide. And the same thing goes with the health offer um, uh, th that, that also has been uh, mapped out. Next slide, please. And I was saying, as I was saying before, neighborhood leaders have been key because they know better who needs more assistance. They help us to quantify in an exact way who needs help, who needs special help, because there might be some non-speaking um, Spanish people um, and the, or people who cannot leave home because they are uh, sick. Um, and they also they have also been very active uh, in helping us organizing the assistance and to communicate inwards into the neighborhoods and outwards from the neighborhood, neighborhoods to the municipality. Next slide, please. Um, and um, if there is uh, anything uh, that needs to be improved, because there are always uh, things to be learned, uh, we still need to coordinate uh, between different levels of governing, uh, government. Uh, we need to co uh, coordinate also horizontally within the municipality uh, between munic municipal agencies, because this is a, a work that has been done by different agencies and also with different stakeholders. Um, it, is in, it is quite important to recognize that we need to adjust interventions in the territory as we move forward and that we need to improve our governance agenda because not every neighborhood or leaders are yet uh, equally prepared to cooperate. But uh, we also know that it is possible to reach out for the most needed and make sure that no one is left behind. Um, it is possible to build social support and trust to voluntarily, voluntarily comply with the required measures Although as we move forward uh, into the quarantine that has become a little bit more difficult, we are able to test in place um, regulations for risk response and fine tune actions. And um, uh, we can be better prepared to implement, to implement recovery programs after the pandemic, which is something that we are working on right now currently. And finally, uh, we can be better prepared not only to face this, uh, this challenge, but also uh, different kind of challenges in the future if we are able to understand that we need to work in a systemic way and through different scales and by designing the right programs. Next slide, please. And of course, this is not um, one person's effort. Um, there are some other people involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. That was a very, very interesting presentation. I, I especially liked the table you, you showed. I think it was in your in your third slide, um, where where you showed how how the different resilience strategies are distributed across you know the different scales and the different parts of the food system. I, I can imagine that this type of visualization can be can be really helpful for decision makers when they try to prioritize um, their investments in in resilience building, right? 
Um, so I think that that's probably uh, a, an interesting example for, for for the people who are listening into into this webinar. Um, so thank you very much, David. Um, so now that all the presentations have been completed, it's time for our uh, Q and A session. Um, so we have selected uh, a few questions. Uh, unfortunately, there were a lot of them, so we will not be able to answer all of them. Um, but I think the first uh, question um, will go for uh, Kate, um, Kate McKenzie. Uh, there's a question from uh, Lisette, I believe, who is asking, um, how is the funding of this elaborate food program organized? And, and connected to this question as well, did the city provide funds to NGOs to work on the distribution and, and other aspects uh, of, of, of the response? Or, or was the, the manpower uh, mostly originating from, from the city? Um, yep, thank you for that question. That's a very important question. Um, so we, again, I would say one of the things that I really appreciated um, around this work is that we just did it. We just started. The city was in a very, um, was in a very good financial situation, um, and we just started uh, putting this operation together. Within three weeks, we had a, a tremendously, uh, this is tremendously expensive, um, and so we then uh, began thinking about, um, you know, we have a, a FEMA, Federal Emergency Management um, Association, uh, to, we're we're looking to FEMA to under, uh, to. Um, reimburse us for a significant um, uh, number of the expenses and also other federal um, resources that that should become available. Um, so so we put forward some of our own money, um, have a very robust plan for federal funding to reimburse the city, and then finally on the topic of um, of of nonprofit organizations or NGOs. We have actually just instituted um, an RFI, a request for information, to be able to um, create a solicitation or a request for proposals for um, for nonprofit engagement. Um, to date, the quantities of food that we have needed have been so vast um, that in order to move very quickly, we had to stand up emergency contracts with large scale providers some of whom do use um, great quality regional product, um, but we needed to ensure that there was a minimum um, 2,000 meal a day capacity, again, just for the scale that we needed. So I hope that helps um, in some of the answers. And so some of the I, I think that was a, a very complete answer. Actually, we got another question for you that uh, actually came up uh, a lot. I think five people asked that question in the in the question box. It's about how you calculated food insecurity at the individual level and what data you used uh, to, to 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 determine this. What what is the index yeah. that you used? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I want to be really clear. These these are rough estimates that we hope to um, we hope to affirm next week, and I'll speak about, about how that is. We're really just overlaying um, a very crude uh, analysis of the unemployment um, numbers um, as they come in. So um, sort of using unemployment as a proxy for food insecurity, which as we know is not perfect, but it's it's likely directionally aligned with, with what the numbers are going to be. And um, we're working with um, a large national organization um, that has a very valid measure of food and ob objective measure of food insecurity. Um, uh, Feeding America produces this um, using a number of data sets, including poverty, unemployment, um, uh, median income, um, to get at sub county um, levels of food insecurity. And they've predicted, um, have predicted values for food insecurity at this level that we are looking forward to receiving um, later this month. And so we'll align those with some of our crude estimates um, to be able to use for uh, planning purposes. Great, thank you very much for a very complete answer. Uh, now we've got also another question for Jamie, um, a question from Matteo Ledesma. He's uh, wondering about your thoughts on, on uh, what is the role of both national and local governments 
and fostering innovation to ensure food availability to the population. So really questions about innovation, not only during the pandemic, but also beyond. Great, um, thanks and thank you for the question. I think you know, one of the, the things that we've seen in the three examples um, that have been provided this afternoon is just how innovative um, municipalities are being in, in addressing some of the problems, um, whether it be in terms of, of creating that space to, to exchange and to buy food, uh, whether it be in terms of the innovations that um, Kate has just been talking about in the way that food is procured or, or secured. Uh, so, so we're seeing many, many you know, adaptations to the, the crisis, but um, yeah, longer term, we also need to think about how the, the roles of national and local governments interact. So ensuring that we're, we're providing that enabling environment by um, fostering a, a, um, yeah, the, the connection between national and urban policies on the one hand, and the space which local governments have to develop their, their food policy and their, their related food systems. Um, yeah, at at EPO, we, we use what we call our urban um, framework for the urban food agenda, uh, which basically has three sort of categories of, of work where we help um, uh, municipalities to, to innovate in terms of improving their food systems. So the first, the, the enabling, as I was saying, it's, it's really you know, getting that policy environment right. So you don't have conflicting policies when it comes to, for example, the promotion of, um, of uh, yeah, production systems within urban and peri-urban systems conflicting with with sort of land tenure or, or um, what you're able to do with space in terms of, of marketing food um, but also in terms of executing you know, movements towards um, short supply chains or, or um, assisting with improved public procurement um, sort of greening cities um, many technologies which are, are being incorporated now into, into cities, not just in production, but also throughout the, the supply chain. Um, yeah, how we ensure that particularly perishable goods, um, we're able to maintain the status, the nutritional status of, of those goods by improved cold chains, for example, et cetera. So I think, yeah, ma many different examples of, of types of innovations that, that are already being made and, and can be pursued in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, now there's a question uh, also specifically for, for David uh, as a resilience expert in, in, in this team. Um, so actually before uh, the webinar, we asked the, the audience, the participants, about what they believe cities should do to better prepare themselves to maintain food access in the face of pandemics or, or other kinds of emergencies. Um, and we, we actually received quite a lot of responses, some, some focused on the importance of uh, short food chains to reduce dependency on imports. Um, I think it connects maybe to what you said about food hubs. Uh, some mentioned the importance of building collaborations between cities and, and the private sector. Others talked about uh, yeah, the importance of networks, alliances, multi-stakeholder platforms, but also urban farming. Um, so, so, so David, uh, you've been involved in, in developing the strategy. What do you think uh, cities can do to better prepare themselves? Thank you for the question. Um, well, um, I think um, I would go first with, with, with a couple of concepts. The first one is that um, if we understand that a system works properly before uh, a catastrophe happens or anything that might disrupt the system um, of course then that system might have a better possibility to work after that catastrophe and, and, and to respond in a better way then the next question is what makes a system work in a proper way what makes a, a food system work in a proper way um, and and then and then there is uh, when the whole analysis of food security and um, uh, comes um, in, in comes in place and, and it's uh, probably the best way to start by recognizing what are the actors of, of, of the system and what are their roles uh, in the system um, how are regulations affecting or not um, the, the, the way the system is uh, functioning and um, how uh, how 
we should be addressing that and what are the different interdependencies um, of that system with other systems for example the innovation the innovation system of the country how knowledge is created and with that how can you use it to uh, improve the food system or how the infrastructure the road infrastructure of, of, of a city in, in the case of Quito for example affects the resilience uh, of, of, of that system I think um, that is I think that is a great way to um, start analyzing um, the food system how it is working and what should be improved what can be improved and how uh, can it be improved um, and and the other and the other um, uh, concept that I think it's uh, quite important to understand is that um, systems should be looked at themselves and then outwards uh, to um, uh, design them and, 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 and to improve them so that they are working properly because they should be prepared not only for known uh, possible challenges but also for the unknown ones and you do that by uh, improving the system itself. Yes, of course, it is important to understand what are the different threats, uh, but also strengthening the system uh, is quite important. Thank you very much, David. Um, we are running short on time, so I think we'll just take uh, two last questions for Esa uh, from Kampala. Um, so the first question is, what are the types of problems that you are seeing and which are specific to low-income areas or informal markets? So what are, what are, those, the, what are those typical problems in, in low-income areas? And the second question um, was uh, about somebody who said that for me, for them, it's not so clear um, what, what the nature of those online apps is. Are those actually from the private sector or are they uh, public? And is there a strategy in place to share the revenues that are generated by, by those apps um, so that the local governments can actually continue to support food security measures thanks to the revenues from those apps? Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, the first question, what are the problems in the informal sector that we see? And first of all, the informal sector, most of them work uh, hand to mouth. And like I said, we had to introduce measures of distancing in markets, for example. That means that uh, each of the vendors has to be spaced at four meters from the next one. It means that the population of vendors in the markets has to be reduced by about a third. So a market that has a vendor population of 1,200 was now reduced to about 400 uh, at a particular time. That meant that they had to uh, develop a, ro a rotor so that the vendors would work on specific days. So some would work on Monday, then the other group would work on Tuesday, then another group would work on Wednesday. Now that means reduced income for the communities. Another thing about the problems in the informal settings, again, is uh, price rise in the food. Uh, because of the lockdown and because of reduced uh, movement of trucks that bring food into the city, uh, the price of food has gone up. So it means that uh, so many families have had to maybe reduce on what would have been uh, an adequate food ration at this particular time. Government in another uh, arrangement is also trying to have food handouts, but uh, it's not uh, uh, purely adequate at the moment, but the challenges in that area. But much as this has also happened, we are quite happy that um, we've managed to maintain some income in the markets so that vendors continue to work and there's a system through which food goes out to the community. Now, uh, what is not clear, uh, there's a question about the e-commerce platforms. Uh, are they private? Uh, is there a way that the revenue generated can be shared to uh, back to the vendors and the city authority? I did mention that we had uh, four options we actually had a situation where the vendor himself or herself could be contacted by a would-be um, uh, uh, customer by phone, because most of them have phones now. And that means that that, that arrangement is between two people, the, the person trying to buy the food and the vendor. The third person is the cyclist, the border border who ride the food from the market to the home of the person buying. That means that money that is generated is actually going directly to the vendor and to the, the cyclist that is bringing the food. The second one was the arrangement where nobody, you don't have a contact with a person in the market, and perhaps you don't have a smartphone. You can only call. 
So we did distribute uh, numbers of market leaders or 29 markets, the major ones, and we advertised them widely on um, social media and all the city authority platforms. Now, once again, the, the job of the market leader is just to connect, make a contact to the vendor who will pack the food and get a cyclist to the consumer. Once again, the funds generated will be shared with the transporter and the person that wants to buy the food. The third one I talked about was the e-commerce platform, which you want to know about. Now, those are private sector led. And um, at the moment, it was uh, one that was working and looking mainly at um, household incomes. That's very big at the moment and clothes. So we actually uh, drew them into the market food and asked them to include a platform for food. Now, once again, um, the revenues generated go to the consumer, I mean, to the, sorry, to the vendor who's actually selling the food, but also the private company makes some money for the service that has been rendered. We are still in talks with them because we think that we want to promote that and we want to see how we can plow down, plow back some of the revenues to actually expand this platform and also get more vendors involved in online marketing because they do appreciate it and it keeps link with uh, customers for them. Plus also um, for those that work uh, in shifts, they can actually not lose the customers that they had originally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asa. I think that answers the question uh, very clearly. Um, so now, now our webinar is actually uh, coming to a close. Uh, it's, it's been already an hour and, and, and 15 minutes. Uh, and actually when preparing for this webinar, um, together with the colleagues from ICLE, from RUA, from UN Environment, uh, from FAO, we actually identified uh, a series of key messages that uh, we wanted to convey through this webinar. Um, it's quite hard to narrow them down to just a few, but, but here's our take uh, to wrap up uh, this discussion. Um, so first, actually su successful urban uh, responses require the active collaboration of various categories of actors. Local authorities, of course, civil society, but also businesses, academia, uh, and, and, and also they require us to work across different sectors. Um, and, and, and basically one of the messages we wanted to, to, to emphasize here is that, you know, working in silos is, is very likely to lead to more problems uh, down the road, hence the importance of, of multi-stakeholder uh, collaborations, which I think came, came across uh, most of the presentations that we, we had today. Um, the second message is that uh, food SMEs, smallholder farmers and the informal sector are essential actors to maintain access to, to healthy food uh, in the face of emergencies. And, and that means that we need to make sure that they are rightly valued. Um, and, and, and that's maybe not yet the case uh, in, in, in today's society. And, and finally, um, the last message is that um, urban food resilience depends largely on the strength and the flexibility of networks within the food system that are able to quickly come together uh, when, when something happens and to organize their collective action together. Um, so maybe one of the key takeaways is that in times of prosperity, when we are not facing a crisis, let's, let's make sure that we invest in them uh, and that we build those networks because they are what enable us to, to be stronger and, and to build more resilient uh, food systems. Um, just a, a few more words uh, to, to basically advertise a, a few upcoming events that are organized by the, the partners of this webinar. The first one is that on the 3rd of June, uh, there will be another webinar organized under the, the One Planet Network uh, umbrella that will focus on COVID-19 and sustainable food systems. Um, Dr. David Nabarro, who is um, the, the WHO um, uh, envoy for COVID-19 is already a confirmed speaker for, for the webinar. And then also we will have, uh, during the entire month of June, the Africa City Food, City Food Month that is organized by ICLE, uh, talking specifically about uh, nutritious food systems in an African um, city. And yeah, just let me, uh, before, before we end, let me just uh, say thank you very much to, to all the speakers, to Jamie, to Kate, to Esau and, and to David, um, for delivering these inspiring presentations. I think they gave us really a lot of uh, good food for thought. Um, thank you also to all the colleagues from Rua, from FAO, from UNEP, uh, and from, from ICLE, that's, and from Rigolto, of course, as well, who have invested many hours of their time preparing for this webinar. And I think it was, uh, it was, it was fun to work together. 
at least that was on, 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 on my part. And lastly, thank you to the audience for your very good questions and also for showing up on the Friday. Uh, we know it's not always easy to, uh, to have uh, such activities on a Friday afternoon, but thank you for showing up. And lastly, if you want uh, to help us prepare for the next webinar, we have a, a poll that will come up uh, when, we, when we close the webinar, where you can select topics that you think uh, would be interesting for, for further webinars. So help us with this. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. I wish you all to stay safe and healthy uh, and, and have a nice weekend. Goodbye. Thank you.